chapter 4 is where we're going to be looking at this morning. If you have a Bible and want to go ahead and, and turn over there. 1 Peter chapter 4. If you went to the doctor tomorrow and he told you that you only had one week left to live, what would you do? You, you felt fine. Uh, you, your mobility was fine. Your mind was clear. It was, it was sharp as ever. But at the end of the week, you knew you were going to die. What would you do during that week? I'd say most of us would agree that we'd probably spend as much time with our family and friends as, uh, as possible. We probably wouldn't hold back on any diets that we happen to be on right now and watching what we eat. We'd probably eat whatever we wanted to and as much of it and, 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 and enjoy that. Maybe we would take a quick trip to somewhere that we've always wanted to go or somewhere that we, we really enjoy going or doing something that we, we really enjoy doing. We'd probably take a little bit of time to get our affairs in order, make sure the life insurance and, uh, and, and will and all that stuff is ready to go to, to make sure our family was taken care of when we were gone. Uh, some of us might even go skydiving or bungee jumping or something else that we've always been afraid of doing because we didn't want to die and figure, hey, you know, what, what do we have to lose now? What would you do if you knew you only had one week left to have? You might have seen a meme that was going around social media last week centered around uh, Easter that posed that question and, and asked it of Jesus. What would you do? What would Jesus do if he knew he only had a little bit of time left? And then it paused and said, wait a second, he did. He did know he only had a few hours of freedom left. And the one thing that he did was he washed feet. I thought that was some good food for thought, but at the same time, it wasn't really complete. Jesus did a little bit more than just, than just washing feet. We get this whole scene of the upper room and the Passover, and he sits down and prepares this meal uh, that he eats with, uh, with his apostles. He gets down and washes his feet, and after that, uh, they go off to the Garden of Gethsemane, where Jesus spends three hours in prayer right before he's arrested and tried and crucified, crucified that night. If you have your Bibles open to 1 Peter chapter 4, I want to begin reading here in verses 7 through 9 in just a second. And what we see is one of the eyewitnesses that was with Jesus that night, Peter. He tells us that the end is near, and then he kind of gives us some comparisons to what Jesus did when he knew that his, his end was near, that his demise was coming, his death was coming. And, and he compares it to some things or, or gives us some things that we need to do as well. If you've got your Bibles open to 1 Peter chapter 4, starting in verse 7, he says, The end of all things is near. Therefore, be clear-minded and self-controlled so that you can pray. Above all, love each other deeply because love covers over a multitude of sins. Offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. So Peter tells us here just three simple things that are easy to understand that we need to do because the end is near. His first thing he says is you need to pray. Well, Jesus did that. He spent three hours, in fact, praying in the Garden of Gethsemane. The, the second thing that he tells us to do is that we're to love one another, to love each other deeply. Well, Jesus obviously did that. It was his love that sent him to, to the cross for us in, in the first place, his love for all of us. And then the third thing he tells us to offer hospitality to one another. Well, Jesus does that too. He has this meal, this private meal in the upper room where he sits down with his apostles and, and he shares that last supper with them right before he was arrested. I want to dive this morning in, into Peter's instructions a little bit further, a little bit deeper, and look at, kind of contrast that with, uh, uh, with Jesus' final hours a little bit more closely so that we can see how as Christians we're supposed to live our lives as, as we're in our final days, as we're in our last days. I know that sounds kind of odd, but Peter's telling us that the end is near. Like, understand what he's saying. Your end is near. Your life is almost over. Now, that's not something that we really like to think about a whole lot, but it's true. Your life is almost over. It might not be this week or this month or this year or this decade, but in the grand scheme of eternity, your life is almost over. The Bible tells us this, that, that life is like a, a little vapor. It's here for just a little bit, and then it's gone. Know your song we sing in, in all the hymn book uh, is Amazing Grace. And there's a verse in there, the last verse that says, When we've been there 10,000 years, we've only just begun. 
It's talking about the brevity of life compared to, to how long eternity is. And the things that we need to do to get ready for this, because the end is near, Peter kind of lays it out for us in our text. He tells us three things. First off, he says, be clear-minded and self-controlled so that you can pray. So he's just told us that the end of all things is near. And he's basically saying, you're either going to die or the Lord's going to come back. And this is going to happen uh, fairly quickly in, in the grand scheme of things. Well, when you hear that, it's kind of a shock to the system. It, it would be like going to the doctor. If you went to the doctor tomorrow and he said, you've only got one week to live, that's a shock to the system. And most of us are going to respond in one of two ways. Most people, when they hear life-altering news, just some, some big news that's going to change the rest of their life, they respond in one of two ways. Some people will shut down and not do anything except for just sit there and think about what that means. Just kind of ponder it over and, and try to grasp exactly what that means and, and, and all of what that entails. Other people to not think at all, they just get up and act. They just go and, and do something. It might not do anything that makes sense, but they just go and, uh, and, and, and do, and they're going to do something. Even if it's the wrong thing, that's, that's how they respond. So Peter, when he addresses these two natural reactions that people have to, or tend to have about life-changing news, he does so by telling us to do this. He says, clear your mind and practice self-control with your actions so that you can pray. You know, it's, it's, it's kind of hard to pray when you're all rung up about something, isn't it? You ever tried to pray like immediately when you just get like really mad or immediately when some, you've just learned some horrible news and you stop right there and pray? I, I know that when I do this, like I'll try this sometimes. And if I haven't cleared my mind or started to practice self-control, my prayer is 100% about my will and never about God's will. It's not until the mind gets right and the self-control starts to take a place. Then we can have that clear mind. We can have that practice, that self-control, and, and be praying something that makes a little bit more sense in, in, in that. That's what Peter's telling us to do. I, I wonder when he's telling us this, if he didn't have in his mind the night that, that Jesus was betrayed and, and later crucified. That night, Peter watched he was an eyewitness. He was right there with Jesus as he was arrested and tried and executed. And in the midst of all that, that chaotic, life-changing, the life-changing events of that night, Peter did something that was completely out of character for him. I mean, we're talking about the guy that preached the first sermon in, in, in like 50 days after this happened. We're talking about a guy that was later executed because of his faith in Jesus, crucified upside down. We're talking about the man that made the very first confession that he believed that Jesus was the Christ, the Southern living God. He made it in front of all the other apostles. He was the one that did that. Yet on the night that Jesus was arrested and all the chaos that was going along with that and, and the crucifixion, Peter did not even know in Jesus three times. He got caught up in, in the chaos of everything that was going on and he lost his mind. He didn't control his actions. So now he's telling us saying, look, the end of all things is near. And what you need to do is make sure your mind is clear. You need to make sure your actions, that, that you're, you're having self-control. Because he, is, he watched as Jesus, he exemplified this. He lived it out perfectly. Here Jesus is, he's the one that's about to die. He spends three hours in prayer. And he taught his disciples and Peter's passing this, this on to us so that we'll understand it. He, he learned that through prayer, we can look death right in the eyes and, and never waver. But it takes that clear mind and it takes that self-control of our actions but to, to, to get to that point. The second thing that he tells us that we need to do because the end is near. He says, above all, love each other deeply because love covers over a multitude of sins. Okay, here's the deal. I'm going to guess that in a, in a room with this number of people, there are probably a few, at least, that came in here this morning and you are holding a grudge against somebody in your life. Maybe you're holding a grudge against somebody that, that you work with uh, or that, that you're, you're living with. Or you might be holding a grudge with the person sitting on the opposite pew from you. you know? But you might be holding a grudge because somebody did something to you that hurts you or somebody said something to you that hurts you and it could have been decades ago but you still remember it. you still remember what they did 
You still remember what they said. They might not even remember doing it anymore. They might not have even done it with any evil intentions, but you remember it, and you've chosen not to forgive them. And you've chosen not to forgive them. Even if they've repented, even if they've changed, you've chosen not to do this. And if that's the case, let me say, the reason that you've chosen not to forgive them is because you don't love them. See, you cannot love somebody and not forgive them if, if they repent. It's impossible. You can say you love them, but... If you don't forgive somebody when they repent, you're a liar. You, you don't really love them. It's like this. The more you love somebody, the quicker you are to forgive them. Fran, I can do something dumb to her. I can say something dumb to her. And you can do or say the exact same dumb thing, and she'll forgive me faster because she loves me. She loves me more than she loves you. She's my wife. Like, she signed the paper. She's signed up for it. She's going to forgive me faster than she'll forgive you. Same thing is true of your kids. Your kids are going to do, and they're going to say things that you don't like. Amen? They're going to act in ways that you wish they wouldn't. They're going to do things that you don't approve of. And we'll correct them, and we'll rebuke them, and we'll punish them, and all this kind of stuff. They're still going to do this stuff. But you know what? There will never be anybody on this earth that will forgive them quicker than we will. Because we're their parents, right? They were made, they were born in our image and our likeness. They look like us, they talk like us, and they act like us. Which is why they need to be forgiven sometimes. And when they sin, when they do something wrong, even if it's against us, we are going to be the quickest people there are to, to forgive them. What Peter's telling us here in our text is he's saying, look. We need to love each other so deeply that it covers over a multitude of sins. So we'll be, we'll be quick to forgive one another. He's telling us that because he watched Jesus live it out in his last few hours of, of freedom before he was arrested and, and crucified. As Jesus was being betrayed, or excuse me, as Jesus was being arrested there in the Garden of Gethsemane, <laughs> Peter sees this going on. Now remember, this is the guy that's writing our text, telling us to do this. Peter sees Jesus being arrested and he's like, I got his back. This is my Lord. He pulls out his sword. Good thing for the guy that he took a swing at, the, the arresting officer. Peter was a fisherman. He wasn't much of a fighter. Uh, he could make a cast, but he wasn't good with a sword. He took one good swing at the guy's head. He wanted to lop his whole head off, and he missed. Instead, he just got an ear. Well, the ear's laying there on the ground. Peter's probably drawing back. He's going in for another swing, and Jesus stops him. He rebukes him. He says, Peter, put your sword away. And then Jesus does something unbelievable. For this officer that was there, this soldier that was there to arrest him and hang him on a cross, Jesus reached down, picked the guy's ear up, and slapped it back on the side of his head and healed him. He forgave him. He forgave him because he loved him. Later, as Jesus was hanging on the cross, he, he said probably the most infamous statement that, that keeps getting repeated over and over of Jesus he says, Father, forgive them, for they know, what, they know not what they do. He was willing to forgive the people that were executing him, that were murdering him, even in their act of murder, because he knew, he understood that they didn't get the depths of what they were doing. Look, life is short. It is too short to be holding grudges. And it is too short to, to not forgive one another. I mean, just think about this. And just trust me, if, if you... If you don't forgive somebody and you got, you're caught up knee deep in a grudge and then you're standing before Jesus and his throne of judgment one day. Can you imagine how this is going to go down? Jesus, forgive me. I'm not willing to forgive anybody else. You know, I'm not I'm going to hold on to my grudge, but I'm asking you to forgive me. I wonder if he'd remind us of the Lord's prayer. Remember, part of the Lord's prayer is, Father, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. He's saying, you get to set the standard of forgiveness. What you're willing, to, the standard of forgiveness that you're willing to offer to others, your, your forgiveness to them, that's the same standard that he's going to use, that he's going to use to you. So Peter's got a good lesson there for us. Just get over ourselves and, and forgive other, others and, and move on. Life's too short to be holding any grudges. Then the third thing he says is this, offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. If anybody ever had a right to complain about something or to grumble about something or someone or to treat someone bad, it would have been Jesus. 
here he was. He's eaten this last supper, uh, a meal that he has had prepared, and he's with a group of people that consists of Judas, who had already sold him out behind his back for 30 pieces of silver. Thomas, who was going to doubt him. Peter, who was going to deny him. And the other nine apostles, who when he was arrested, every one of them fled. They ran and they abandoned him. Yet here's the thing about all of them. When they sat down at that last supper, every one of them ate. And when Jesus went around to wash their feet, to show them that he was there to serve them, he washed every one of their feet. You never know the act of hospitality that, or, or the act of kindness that is going to make an impact on somebody's life. But they do. Let me make a, an observation about this too. Because I think this needs to be addressed with this. Most of the time, when you've got an opportunity to extend someone some hospitality, it never comes at a convenient time for you. Never. Like, it, it, it just doesn't. You're always, you're always really busy. Or you're about to do something else. Or you've got a whole lot on your plate. And that's when the opportunity to be hospitable, that's when it presents itself. And the temptation is, I'm just going to ignore this thing. You know, I, I see the lady that's sitting over there on the side of the road and she's got a flat tire. But if I just stare straight and I just ignore her and act like I don't see her, then I won't have to stop and, and, and help her out and keep on going. Or you look at your phone and you see that it's somebody that's calling and you know they're calling you because they need you to do something. And maybe it's, it's real tempting to hit that ignore button. Or just slide that text away and, and, and not respond to it right then. But you can't do that, can you? Because the Holy Spirit will eat you up if you do that one. It will guilt you if you do that. It's like, man, I, I, I got I to gotta do this. I'm going to help them out. But what about your attitude? Even if you do the right thing, how's your attitude in that? Peter doesn't address just doing the right thing. He says, offer the hospitality. That's, that's a no-brainer. You're, you're going to do that anyway. Offer the hospitality, but he adds this. He says, do so without grumbling. Now he gets to the heart of the issue. A lot of y'all know my buddy Parker. Uh, Parker was, uh, Parker's the elderly black gentleman. He lives back here behind the church. He was actually walking through the parking lot right before church. He stands up here at the uh, stop sign uh, a few times every day and gets him a ride to town and back. And it was kind of neat. Everybody was coming in. And most everybody in here, if you live in our community or pass through, most everybody has picked Parker up and, and run him to town or, or, or back before. Um, as he's gotten a little bit older, he used to never ask for a ride. But now he'll pretty much stop by church every day and ask for a ride. And I love Parker and, and, and our rides together. But... Um, He's, all, he's always been funny about this thing. He'll, he'll go to town to get him some groceries and to get him a soda to drink. And uh, uh, soda pops, soda beer pops, some alcohol, liquor, 40s. I don't know, whatever he's got in there. He's got him something, though. But Parker would always let me give him a ride to town. But if I saw him uptown, he'd never let me give him a ride back. And I thought it was odd. I mean, I would leave, and then the next thing I know, somebody else would be bringing him back by. I said, I wonder why they So I just asked him one day, I said, Parker, why you always let me take you to town but never back? And he said, well, Rev, it's kind of like this. I, I don't think it would be appropriate for me to be bringing some soda in the, in the preacher's truck. <laughs> All right. I never said anything, but... Parker got so much soda in him all the time, you know, it really wouldn't. But anyway, as he's gotten older and, he, and he's got some health issues, he can't, he can't get along. And uh, so now when I'm uptown and see him on the way back, he'll take the ride. And he's got like, the, he's worked it out morally for himself now he puts his soda in the bed of the truck <laughs> and he rides in the cab and he's worked that out. He's worked that out morally. <laughs> I love Parker. I got a confession, though. Parker never needs a ride at a convenient time. Like, he never does. It's always, I'm like, I'm going somewhere. Most of the time, it's in the opposite direction and, or, or got something to do. But it's one of those deals like, you can't leave the guy standing there. You got to pick him up. You got to take him to town. And you do it. But I, I'll, I'll be honest. For a while, I did it begrudge him. And I was like, man. I did it, and I would never say it out loud. I would never say anything to him about it or anybody else. But, you know, I, I grumbled to myself about it. Picked him up, and, 
And then we talk, and we talk all the way to town or, or, or back or whatever. And every time he got out of the truck, I'd always say, all right, Parker, you have a good day. He always says, well, I already had a good day because I saw you. <laughs> it dawned on me one day, the, the best part of Parker's day isn't going to get that drink. That's just become something his, his body, unfortunately, needs probably at this point. It's just become accustomed to. The best part of his day is that couple mile ride that somebody's showing him some attention. And that talk to town or back. That somebody's just letting him know that, that he matters. That they care about him. And, and, and that they love him. You know, when God puts an opportunity in front of us to show hospitality to somebody, take it. And, and when you take it, 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 might, it might cost you a few minutes. It might be at an inconvenient time, but take it. Jesus sets the example for us in this. Here he is. He's eating with a crowd of backstabbers and the apostles. Every one of them is going to turn their back and, and betray him in some way or another. If he could eat with them, I'm pretty sure we can find it to be inconvenienced a little bit just to show some hospitality and to do it without grumbling. Just, just have the right heart. Because we know what we've done to Christ. We know the sins that we've committed. We know the ways that we've betrayed him. And we've denied him. And we've doubted him. And every time, he's willing to forgive us. Every time, his offer that he's given us on the cross of salvation, every time it's still there. He never grumbles about it. He never fusses about it. He just accepts us back. He forgives us willingly. That's the example that we see for him, from him. That's how we're called to prepare as the end of all things is near. Would y'all stand with me this morning as we pray? Father, I thank you for just this lesson you give us from Peter. And I witnessed that, got to see how things went down as, as Jesus' last moments of freedom uh, played out and the things that he did and the lessons that he teaches us. And Lord, I just pray that we would live this out, that we will live this message out, Father, um, every day in our lives as we have that opportunity. And Lord, we, we realize that in the scope of eternity, the end is near. You know, we've got, we've got years on this earth, but there are centuries and millennial that we'll get to spend in heaven for all of eternity with you. So I just pray that we'll keep our priorities right on this earth, Father, and they'll be centered around serving you and loving you and, and serving and loving other people, Father. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Good morning, Gold Point family and Junior Church kids. I'm so excited to bring you another lesson on this theme of ordinary to extraordinary. Last few weeks, we've been looking at this idea of how, how things or how we could be from ordinary to extraordinary. The first week that we looked at it, we looked at fruit and we saw how different fruit can be ordinary. But yet you add things to it and stuff and it makes it extraordinary. Banana pudding, apple pie, things like that. We talked about also the fruit in our lives, the way that we can bear fruit, the way that we can be able to either bear good or bad fruit. Last week, we looked at how we could help other people. We, we looked at the, the parable that Jesus explains where he, he says that there's one person with five bags of gold and then there's two with two bags of gold and there's one with one bag of gold. And we talked about the different bags of gold and we explained and we looked at how can we use those bags of gold, our talents, our gifts to be able to glorify God and to help other people through it. This week, we're going to do something or I want you to do something that is ordinary to extraordinary. What I want you to do is instead of me asking or showing you extraordinary things, I want you to make something make something ex that is extraordinary and give it to someone else. Okay, so that may be where you make them make a letter, make a card, right? And you can write up there of saying, um, "I hope someone feels better," or uh, "I hope you have a great day," or something like that, to be able to help people to uh, to have a good day, to be able to know that people are thinking of them, that that you could be able to uh, write different things to uh, to just help people throughout their day. Maybe it's not the idea. Maybe maybe writing is not your thing. Maybe it's this idea of. Uh, of baking something. If you look, this is the no-bake Oreo stuff. 
And what this is, is it, it takes 15 minutes to make. You don't have to bake anything with it. Uh, it is simply just uh, putting the ingredients together. You need butter and you need milk. So you can buy this from Food Line or probably any store. Uh, so if this is something that you would like to do, to be able to make something for someone, maybe someone just moved in next door. Maybe it's someone that isn't doing well. Maybe they're sick. Maybe they're not feeling well. Maybe you could make something for them. There's a lot of different things that we could do. And so as we look at this, I, I do want to kind of put a little bit of a commercial there and say, if, you are, if you're not allowed to use the stove or oven, let's say you're not old enough, do not use it without your parents being there and helping you with this. Okay. Now, if you're going to write a letter or whatever, by all means, write the letter. But do not go and go out and give it to whoever without your parents knowing. Okay. So we are trying to be from ordinary to extraordinary people, but yet we also have to be safe at the same time. So I want you to make something this week from ordinary to extraordinary. Um, and I, if you if you want, you can uh, let me know of what you did. Uh, send me a text or a picture of maybe what you did, and we can put it on the on the screen next week. Um, but anyways. Ordinary to extraordinary, I want you to make something. Why do I bring out this idea of doing something for someone else? Why, why do I bring up this idea that uh, to set the example for someone else? Well, that is exactly what Jesus did and, and, and what we are going to look at of how Jesus um, showed the example to his disciples. This is right before Jesus is about to die on the cross, right before he's about to uh, be sentenced to death on the cross. He does one, one, one last thing of a few of many, but one last thing he does, and I want us to look at that this morning. If we look at John 13, I want to read through this and understand more of what Jesus did for not only his disciples, but what we should do for one another. Check this out. It was just before the Passover festival, Jesus knew that the hour had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. I'm going to speak for us and we thank God and we thank Jesus for the love that they have for each one of us. The way that they love us and care for us even to the end. Even to, to death on a cross that they loved us through those things. They love us through our sin. Even though we try not to sin. Uh, they love us through all different things, and even here to the very end, Jesus loved them, and he loves us as well. The evening meal was in progress, and the devil had already prompted Judas, the son of, uh, of Simon Iscariot, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power, and that he had come from God and was returning to God. So he got up from the meal took off his outer clothing and wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with a towel wrapped around him. They wore two things of clothing. One was an inner part of clothing and the other one was the outer part of clothing. And so what he did was he took, let's just say like a coat for us or a, or a you know, something that was the outer clothes that we would wear. And he wrapped, him, wrapped it around him and wrapped the towel around him. And what does Jesus do? Jesus washes his disciples' feet. Now, that is not something that a teacher or master or, or up, upper person does. This is more of a lowered servant job. This is a lower servant job where, where they go and they wash people's feet. And, and now know that they didn't have tennis shoes on that, that protects their feet. They wore sandals and, and also they didn't have concrete and, and different hard places to walk where it doesn't make your feet all dirty. They had dirt roads that they walked on. And so this was a, this was a, this was a nasty job to wash someone's feet that has been in sandals. Some, some of them may not even had sandals. And so they would have to wash their feet as they were, they were there. And Jesus did this for his disciples. And it says this, He came to Simon Peter who said to him, Lord, are you, washed, are you going to wash my feet? And Jesus replied, You do not realize now what I am doing, but later you will understand. No, said Peter, you shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered, unless I wash you, you have no part with me. 
Then Lord, uh, then Lord Simon Peter replied, Not just my feet, but my hands and my head as well. Jesus is washing his disciples' feet. And one thing that we can't take for granted is to see that Jesus is washing each of the disciples' feet, even Judas' feet. That he washed their feet, even knowing what, Ju what Judas is about to do to Jesus. He's washing their feet. Peter says here, Lord, you don't wash my feet. Like that, that's not what, that, that's what, not what you need to do. That's not what you should do. And Jesus says, if I don't wash your feet, you have no part of me. And, and Peter says, well, then wash my whole body. And Jesus says, Jesus answered, those who have had a bath need only to wash their feet. Their whole body is clean and you are clean, though not every one of you. For he knew who was going to betray him. And that was why he said not, not everyone was clean. Jesus washed his disciples' feet. And I'm going to re, re say this again. That he washed Judas' feet. The one who's going to betray him. He washed his feet as well. When he had finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes and returned to his place. Listen to what Jesus says here. Do you understand what I have done for you? He asked them. You call me teacher and Lord. And rightly so. For that is what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also wash. You also should wash one another's feet. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. Truly, very truly, I tell you, no servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. Jesus is saying, regardless of what stature or what label you're called, we're all on the same level plane. That regardless of what whoever does, that, that whatever that may be, that we're all on the same equal level. So what did we learn this week? We learned that even though Jesus was about to die on the cross, he showed the ultimate service, servanthood of washing his disciples' feet. Jesus did one of the lowest jobs to make a point to, to tell his disciples to love people, to love each other. And number three, Jesus sets an example of what we should do for others. And so, goals for this week. Know that Jesus set an example for each one of us as well. Not only for disciples, but for us as well. This week, help someone. Quote, unquote, may not mean that you, that not mean that this is exactly what you have to do, but wash someone's feet. Do something for somebody. We talked about making something. We talked about uh, designing something or, may, or doing a letter or something or making food. Something to be able to help people understand that they're important. The last one. Show kindness to people that may not be that nicest back to you. Which is sometimes extremely hard. But that's what Jesus did as the example. Today we looked at Jesus and he washed the disciples' feet. And so this week, I want you to do something that instead of is ordinary, I want you to do it that is extraordinary.